Hi, this is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium. And I'm excited today that uh, we are going to have an opportunity to hear from Dr. Jeff Levy, who is CEO of Case Network. And Dr. Levy, I'm turning things over to you. Thank you, Larry, and I appreciate uh, the introduction and uh, look forward to having some um, questions at the end about the conversations that we're going to be having. Um, I want just to briefly introduce myself. So as Larry said, I'm founder and CEO of Case Network, and I'm a physician, have been a past residency program director, a medical student program director, and also have been the medical director of the University of Pennsylvania Health System. And so I have a good understanding of the types of things that are needed at each level of education. And I have a passion for technology-enhanced medical education and have really been involved in that for the last three decades and have led some of the efforts in some new technologies and bringing them to the educational field, the medical educational field. And also, we're not going to talk about it today, but I'm also very interested in wellness for physicians and have written a book on core wellness. So I want to talk a little bit about a personal educational quest and then get into the program. My goal has always been to create a global standard for education and training of healthcare professionals by providing the most advanced and innovative framework for conveying content, measuring skills, and improving proficiencies. And I've had the wonderful opportunities to go across the world and present some of these concepts that you're going to be hearing today and really trying to help figure out how to not only standardize but modernize medical education. But to understand where we're trying to go, we have to understand a little bit of where we've been. And you can see on the slide here, William Osler, and he's considered really one of the fathers of American medicine. And he really did wonderful things in the apprenticeship model all the way back into the 1880s. And it was really kind of the see one, do one, teach one era. But education completely was dependent on the expertise and availability of that expert. And he was one of the great experts, but not every institution had those kinds of experts. So the next thing that we did is we really tried to standardize more of what we were doing. And we did it in the form of a classroom. And you can see back 50 years ago, um, a, uh, a nice Norman Rockwell image of the students in a classroom. And the problem with the classroom is we can standardize education. Uh, we only can do it at a local level, and we're not really trying to individualize the information that you're getting. So some information is going to be too advanced for some of the students. Some's going to be not advanced enough, and we're going to lose some of the students. And I'll talk about personalizing education and using some modern techniques to do that in the future. But you can see on the bottom screen that it's a very similar scene um, back, you know, all the way now into 2019 and with our medical students and our residents. And almost every residency program has classroom settings, but they're really not an effective way to teach medicine and to standardize the types of things that we are teaching. So I started investigating how we can have more standardization across the entire country back in 1988 and developed the first laser disc in medicine. And we were really then able to connect text, audio, and video and deliver it to people wherever they were. And so that was the start of technology enhanced education. And then in 1990 to 1995, we were able to change it from those big discs down to the little CD ROMs. And I developed the first five CD-ROMs in the field of uh, OBGYN. That's my specialty. But we were still kind of at a linear level. We really weren't able to do a lot with clinical reasoning. We weren't able to personalize the education as much. But we were able to do some more with standardization. So the next step was really trying to figure out how can we begin to personalize the information? How can we start giving information that was more structured knowledge, that we can get individuals to link and apply new information that was clinically relevant to them? So we started in 1995 working on cognitive simulations. These are virtual patients. These are case-based types of education. 
And we started at Jefferson Medical College. I was uh, there at the time in teaching students. And we started there, and we found that in studies that we did, the students were much more interested. They were much more engaged. They were more satisfied with the learning styles in this case-based form of education. They had greater retention than they did in lectures, and they showed more self-direction in their learning. So these are all extremely positive things. So we started taking this online learning to the next step. And the next thing we did uh, back in the late uh, 1990s and into the early 2000s is we started creating a lot of CNE programs that use this form of case-based education. We developed 600 cases in 20 different specialties covering 5,000 conditions and disease states, and we were able to educate not only in the United States, but we were able to start standardizing and educating across the world, and we educated about 400,000 physicians in a 10-year period across the world. And we were not only able to educate in a fairly standardized way, but we were able to do some pretty groundbreaking things. So in, in 2001, when we had our first outbreak with anthrax, within seven days, we partnered with the CDC and we put out case-based education to teach 20,000 physicians across the country how to deal with anthrax. And we taught 20,000 physicians in the first 30 days of getting the program out. And later we did the same for SARS and for MERS as well. So it really was an exciting time. And so I want to get you now into a little bit more of where we are today, and then I'm going to take you into the future. So today we have a program that we've developed called Core Cases, and it's for residents and for medical students. And so far we've developed it in four different specialties, obstetrics and gynecology, family medicine, internal medicine, and emergency medicine. And we have plans over the next couple of years to also do pediatrics, anesthesia, and general surgery. And the way it looks for each specialty, and I'm going to give an example of OBGYN, which was our first curriculum, but the way it looks for each specialty is we have a series of cases, and in this curriculum it's 56 cases, and we cover um, many different kinds of disease states. In OBGYN, we cover about 300. We cover about 250 in family medicine and internal medicine as well. And we have a lot of questions that we can ask uh, throughout the cases. And so it's a summative assessment that we have and about 600 questions in this curriculum. And we have about 1,500 multimedia elements. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes and talk about why that's important. But on the right-hand side, you can see that we're starting to try to personalize the education to the level of experience of the resident or the medical student. And here for the residents, we have cases that are specifically designed for first-year residents and second-year residents and third-year residents and so on. And that becomes important to start personalizing that information. But again, I'll show you at the end and how we think we can even do it a little bit better. So we started off doing this case-based education, and along the way we learned that there are many important educational strategies that we can use to improve the learner experience and improve the retention. So the first is we really have to understand our learners, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The second is we can do some really interesting things in online education to teach communication skills. And so that's something that I think we can do pretty well, and I'll show you how we approach that. The third is that we can really deal with and um, I think train with active clinical reasoning skills, uh, different kinds of learning. And so I think that's important, and we'll show you how we do that. And then we can get into some contextualized learning and some formative feedback, and those are really important components in case-based education. We'll talk about some training engagement, how do we get the, the, the students that we're training to be very engaged in the programs, and then we'll talk about some of the metrics and reporting and why they're important. Um, at the end, I'll come back to the future enhancements that are really going to take us into the future. So let's first start with understanding your learners. And again, I'm going to go a little bit back in time. And the picture on the left-hand side is Albert Einstein. And there are researchers that have an EEG machine, and the electrodes are connected to his head. And they're trying to figure out why he is a genius, why he has such great intelligence. 
And so our understanding of intelligence and how we learn was very, very primitive and still, I think, is somewhat primitive, um, but we are gaining a lot of new knowledge. And so you can see on the right-hand side that we have different ways that we learn, and it could be through a logical, mathematical way. It could be through verbal linguistics, interpersonal, uh, intrapersonal, visual, spatial, body kinesthetic. And these are all important things that we need to do as we understand our learners. And then learning, we have to really understand as well, is not only cognitive, but it's the motor, the psychomotor, it's the behavioral, and it's the social aspects as well. So these are all important components that you need to, to review and understand as you're trying to understand your learner. The next thing is really trying to teach effectively communication skills, and we can do that online. Now, we want to be able to practice this in person as well, but let me show you what we can do, and, and this is a really effective method. The first step is that we show a video, and that video is usually of some kind of scenario. Here, it's a very simple scenario of a physician, and they're um, interacting with a patient, and sometimes that could be a standardized patient. Um, we like to use real physicians as we do this, but sometimes it could be standardized patients. And then the resident or the medical student interacts with that video that they just saw. And they tell us what they think was done right or wrong, and they grade that, and then they get some expert feedback right away. Step two is they reflect on what they would have done differently. And then step three is we demonstrate what a really good example looks like. And we find if we go from that bad to reflection to good, it's a great way to get the residents and the medical students to understand not only basic communication skills, but very advanced communication skills as well, and then be able to utilize them in their practice. So that's one way that we like to deal with communication skills. With clinical reasoning, we like to look at that in a specific way as well. We like to give the resident or the medical student some choices, and usually we give them about eight to ten choices. We find that that's an optimal number to really discern if they know something well or they don't know it and the grades in between. So we allow them to make their choices, and as they make their choices, you can see here they got a five out of five with that choice. It's very good on the scale of one to five, but then we're gonna give them a lot of different kinds of feedback and information. And that feedback and information in the moment is really the key to increasing retention. So we can give them that formative feedback and the formative feedback starts with, yes, you made a good choice, but we're also gonna show them as we get into the virtual expert on the next slide, not only was it a good choice, but here's the reason why it was a good choice in this particular case in this situation. So let's click on that virtual expert and we can learn a little bit more, not only about that formative feedback, but also contextualized learning. If I can give you the information you need in that moment in time when you really want it and you're seeking it, I can change your retention from 15% that you might get in a lecture to almost 80% that you're going to get in this kind of environment where you're getting that information in the moment when you need it. So the contextualized learning is absolutely key, and we're going to provide important information like that's evidence-based, like you know what's the incidence and prevalence of a disease? What are the signs and symptoms? Uh, what kinds of things might you look for in a specific kind of patient? What's the physical exam findings that are important in this kind of patient? Those contextualized facts are things that are going to improve that retention. Now, I mentioned also that we really want to engage our trainees. And as we're trying to engage them, one of the forms of engagement is providing them some really good multimedia uh, uh, information within the program. And you can see here, it's not only those communication skills we talked about in that video, but we're gonna give them clinical images, surgical images, pathologic images, radiologic images, EKGs, medical illustrations. And on the bottom side, you can see very importantly, when we're dealing with some procedure-related education, we can provide videos 
that are specifically related to that kind of procedure. And it's a, if it's a procedure that's an emergency, sometimes we can't provide actual clinical or patient images or videos. Sometimes we have to provide things that are on simulators, as you can see on the bottom right. Now, if we don't measure it, we can't change it. So everything that we're doing in the background, we're measuring every single move that the resident or the medical students make. We're, we're measuring all the choices, and we're looking at that very specifically from a perspective of what competencies and milestones and what clinical knowledge is important for this medical student or resident to know. So we create the appropriate metrics, and if we do that, then we can provide the appropriate reporting for the uh, program director. And the program director can look at it and say, boy, this resident or medical student is tracking along very nicely in PC2, and they're getting those green diamonds, which means they understand the information and they're getting enough things correct as they're making their decisions as they're going through the cases that they're meeting those metrics and they're actually meeting those milestones. But here on PC3, you can see that it's a red diamond, and the red diamond is showing that there's some clinical knowledge or they're not understanding some of the milestones, and that there are some gaps in that knowledge and that they potentially need some remediation. And then we actually have some programs that can provide some automated remediation as well. But metrics and reporting are absolutely key. So that's a little bit of what we're doing today. And what kinds of things can we do and get into the future? So first, I'm going to talk about personalizing our educational experience. And then I'm going to talk about modernizing our education with the use of uh, augmented reality and also artificial intelligence. So let's look first at personalizing education. You know, we talked about before that we need to provide education in a format where we're not doing things that are too easy for the learner and we're not doing things that are too hard for the learner. If it's too hard for the learner, they're going to get frustrated and they're going to have some anxiety. If it's too easy, they're going to get bored. And either one of those spectrums, we're going to lose the attention of that trainee. So we want to make sure that we're able to get them into a flow channel. That's the information that is comfortable for them and pushing them a little bit, but comfortable for them with their knowledge and experience at that moment in time. And that constantly changes. So we need to be able to look at individuals and how they're changing. And we can do that with some different kinds of programs like machine learning, and we'll get into some of that um, in, uh, in, in a moment. Now, in augmented reality, we can also enhance the experience. And I was involved in a wonderful program. Um, that program was called the Visible Human Project back in the 1990s. And we took human beings that, uh, were, um, that were frozen um, in a block of ice after death, and then they donated their body to science, and then we were able to cut those blocks and find each layer and level of uh, information from that anatomy of that individual, and then stack them back up so we can look at the right-hand top side where we can look at from the skin, we can look at from the musculature, we can look at from the skeleton, we can look at some of the viscera inside, and then we can even do fly-throughs to some of that viscera. Now, some of that work that was done in the 1990s is now being uh, correlated to the augmented reality environment, and we can do the same thing now with these polo lenses or other types of augmented reality devices that we can put over our eyes. And this doesn't block our senses. It allows us to see things in the environment we're already in. So we enhance that environment. We augment that environment. We augment that reality. So here you can see we're doing the similar kinds of things, and you're able to manipulate these images in real time in any environment that you're in using augmented reality. And we think that that's going to have a dramatic effect not only in teaching anatomy, but also in the classroom. 
we talked about trying to personalize that classroom. You know, we see this one individual here that's in the top left, and he's just not interested in what's happening. And again, it might be because it's too easy, too hard, whatever it may be, you're not capturing him. He's not engaged. But if we individualize the learning in an augmented reality environment, we can change the form and the way that lectures are done. We can engage our students, and then we can even create some small projects for those students so they can take their abilities to the next level. And then in case-based education, we have the concept of hollow cases, and we started experimenting with them. So if you put on goggles, we can put you into any environment. We can put you into an environment where it's a clinical setting, we can put you into an environment where it's a surgical setting. We can put you into an environment where you're in um, the emergency department and you're seeing some emergencies coming in. All of those different types of things are possible with these um, different kinds of augmented reality settings. Now, I want to just go over what we also can do for the educational environment with artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, the first is on the top left that most of what we do today is we get information, whether they're practice guidelines, whether it's research studies, whether it's um, information from the literature, and we try to put those into some clinical relevance. We try to understand them from how we can apply them to our clinical practice. And sometimes it's very difficult to extrapolate from those small studies into the large population and to try to individualize the information. Well, today we have what we call real-world data. These are things that we're collecting every day, every minute of the day, and we're collecting it on literally millions of patients now and also on learners. And it's going to complement what we're learning and what we have in the literature. So this is a new form of data. So you take the research, you take this new form of data, we put it into a data repository that we call a data lake, and then we feed it into a machine. And we have experts that train the machine in to what's important and what's not important. And we can do that in a clinical setting or we can do that in an educational setting. And then we have the experts validate what the machine just learned. The machine spits out and says, you know, this is important and these are the top things you need to think about and our experts validate that that's really the most important thing. On the educational side, we must come back to that flow channel and understanding the individual need. We want to make sure that they're staying within this flow channel as they're working their way through new materials, learning new things to make sure that they're learning at their maximum rate, they're retaining that information and they're staying engaged. And we can still do that with some simulated encounters, but now we can personalize based on the knowledge we have about that individual and having millions of patients in this data repository, we can now on the fly be able to create simulated patient encounters that are helping you in your knowledge that you need at that moment in time. So instead of having 56 cases, in a curriculum for OBGYN or family medicine or internal medicine and so on, we can have an unlimited number of cases that are specifically designed for you. So that's going to improve your education and then ultimately improve patient care and outcomes. So those are some of the things that we think that we can do from um, the kind of the historical perspective, where we are presently today and where we really believe that we can be in the future. And I love the Steve Jobs quote, that the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who really do. And you know, I hope that you're one of those people who really thinks that you can make the change and that you can utilize some of this information and that you can take education and modernize it and take it into the future. So if you'd like more information about some of the things that we would do, or some of the things that uh, you can potentially do in the future, um, please, um, you can contact Cami Jacobson. Her number or email is on the bottom of the page, and we're happy to interact with you, and she can connect you with me as well. So, uh, Larry, I'm going to end the, uh, the talk there and then take any questions that people might have. So I have just unmuted all the lines, and we also have 
uh, the uh, comparability of education in the lower left. What that is. No, so 8.7. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. the 5.5 5. 5 oh, is resources for clinical yeah. instruction. That's approximately one third of students express dissatisfaction with the travel time and housing situations. That's mainly the distributed clinical oh, oh. The 5.5 uh, so is think, the educational resources and infrastructure. So I think someone on the line has got a background conversation the going on. Is the curricular management evaluation enhancement. Ah, so that's not a question to me. I was uh, I was wondering, I, I was having trouble understanding that question. Uh, does, anybody, does anybody have a question? Well, well the thing though that's so I was able to isolate the um, uh, particular caller. So if anyone has a, a question for Dr. Levy. If not, we, uh, we thank you for your participation and listening to this, and we hope to have some conversations with you in the future and interact about how we can continually improve medical education. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to further conversations. Thank you, Dr. Levy.